Welcome everyone to the third pilot podcast of our new channel, Coffee Breakdown. And uh, I just want to remind everyone here that the objective of this channel is to strengthen the connection between the scientific world and, well, everyone else in the public. And our belief is that the expression of a more creative and the human side of science is crucial to achieving that goal. And part of that is good communication skills, um, because that is extremely important in order for getting the message out there in a clear and concise manner. And for everyone listening, I just want to remind you that this is a learning process for both me, the host, and all of our guests. So although you as the listeners are probably also learning, I would like you to keep that in mind throughout this entire process. And so today we have as our guest, Marion Spedberg who has just recently graduated from the master programs here at the University of Eindhoven. And yes, welcome, Marian. Hi, happy to be here. Yes, and so how I know you is actually through your master's project, kind of related to colleagues of mine, this whole machine learning thing. But uh, I will spare you the details of having to describe all of that. I don't know if you... <laughs> watch the previous two episodes, but we had uh, Ralph and Michele on here. They described a fair bit about fusion and, you know, the, the science and stuff like that. But I understand you wanted to talk a bit about something different. Um, if I recall correctly, that uh, in one of our previous conversations, you said something about feedback. Do you want to get a, a bit further into that? Yeah, well, like you said, I just graduated from the master's. Very exciting. And, and you know, you give the defense with, which is with your panel and then immediately afterwards they give you the grade, mm. like 30 minutes and you know what you got. And they also give you, yeah, feedback about the defense, the presentation, but also the entire project, which is 30 weeks long. And it's funny because the things that they said in that feedback session, it was my, my supervisor who was kind of leading that. So he went through the entire 30 weeks with me. The things that he gave me feedback on were kind of characteristic. I also got those exact same comments during the end of my internship, which was last mm. summer, that was 10 weeks long. And yeah, it was kind of, it kind of struck me when that happened because there are these characteristic things that I know that I have to work on as a person, as, but specifically as a scientist that, yeah, they don't, they don't get fixed in a day or even in my case in a year. <laughs> Well, that's that's a good point that you bring up because it's hard to distinguish also from my point of view like having graded other students hard to distinguish things that are really due to their understanding or performance of a topic and things that are just you know unique to them you know it's like part of their personality or part of their way of doing things right? So, or, or at least viewpoints on certain things. So is that more or less what you're trying to get at? Is that um, how to give good feedback or, or how, how to give effective feedback? I mean, no, mainly my point is just like, getting that feedback is so important because now I know that there, I have this characteristic trait that actually in, in, case, in some cases holds me back. They were saying that I tend to not ask questions as quickly as I should, not ask for help. Um, yeah, I tend to try to do things on my own too much. I guess, my question would be then, now that you have gotten that feedback, do you necessarily see it as something that you should or could improve? Or is it 
something you never thought about before at all. And now it's just sort of like, that's a thing. <laughs> I mean, it's something that I would always be thinking about, hmm. but in the other direction, I thought I was asking for help too much. Like I didn't want to bother my advisors by, you know, <laughs> constantly having software problems and getting weird errors in my code or with the high performance computing and not knowing where packages existed. And I mean, I bothered you with some of those things as well. <laughs> it was it was never a bother to me. So <laughs> I mean, as, as far as things go, I've had students ask me more frequently questions than you have. So I, I I would I would say that I would agree with your supervisor if this is the case, right? That you you could ask more um, mm. in rela in relation to other students, mm -hmm. but it's I guess there's one thing that's well I have two points but let's go with the first question. One thing that is always on my mind is that when I give feedback back to students. I also give feedback of that nature. Do you think it's effective or, or useful or is it more, because sometimes I get the feeling that I'm telling them things they already know and aren't in the position to fix, you know, so. I mean, I don't see how you could know that, whether it's something they can fix or not. I mean, I wasn't surprised, like it was completely, expected and in that way ironic and funny that my master's thesis advisor was like you need to ask for help more often because I heard those exact words in the internship so yeah it was something I already knew but hearing it again nine months later helped because it drove home to me that oh I have this characteristic and it's difficult because in this, in that specific case, you have to find a balance. I can't be the person who's asking for too much help and not taking personal initiative. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think it's a case of realizing that I'm not gonna be a bother and I don't have to do everything by myself. I can accept that other people have expertise that I don't have. That's that's a good point. So, because I, I would say personally, I have also had that sentiment. Let's say that I am if if I ask too many questions, then I'm bothering the person. You know, especially if they're silly questions. Like, <laughs> I I've since gotten over that by making a fool of myself way too many times. But <laughs> I am. Built up I do. Tolerance. Yeah, exactly. But I've, I, I have understand. to get. I have yet to get there. I yeah. still feel weird about asking silly questions. <laughs> but then I guess I guess in in a way of you know, um, sort of airing that. What do you think was maybe the reason? Like I mean, yes, okay, bothering people is one good reason. But what is the reason behind not wanting to bother people? Right? Like is. Is there something that other other scientists who might be in a similar position as you could do to help alleviate that? Um, I think just remembering that if you're in science, especially, but maybe it's true for all careers, I'm not sure, but especially in science, you're always a student. Mm. You're always learning. You never have arrived. So it's never not okay to be un uncertain of something and to ask for help. Everybody around you is doing the same thing. Mm. The people who you're asking questions to are also asking questions to other people. Mm -hmm. So they know what it's like. And I think 
this feedback that I'm getting is very, very useful to me because it's helping me be a better student, which mm -hmm. by definition is helping me be a better scientist. Right, exactly. Exactly. I think that that's one aspect of science, which I guess doesn't get a lot of light, mm -hmm. right? I guess because I speak to my friends who are not scientists and they always see the scientists as being the ones who know, right? The ones who know everything, yeah. but it, they never, it never gets broadcast out there. It's like, actually scientists are just the same as normal people. They happen to know a bit more about one specific thing, but not everything. And they're also asking questions, just like everyone else. Like they don't know <laughs> some yeah, things I mean, they don't know. <laughs> it's, it's funny because the more you learn in science, the more, the more you feel like you don't know. It's like every question that gets answered leaves you with three more new questions and you get right down to it. And it's kind of amazing what we're able to create given the uncertainty that we have to work with. Like, it's, that was one of the things that they taught us in the masters. It was a class on how to effectively communicate the uncertainty in your work. Like one of the really big examples that we worked with in the class was Corona and, and um, epidemiologists and their papers were being used to make policy decisions and affect people's lives. So these scientists had to find a way to communicate the uncertainty that that they, that they knew maybe, you know, subconsciously, you know, these models are not fully accurate representations of life. And, you know, they say, oh, if you put a curfew um, at 11 p.m., maybe it will reduce the caseload by this much, but that's just according to the model. And whether that actually represents real life is something that it's a scientist's duty to convey. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess in that aspect, this whole thing with Corona and the pandemic was also a very interesting test case because it's never usually so direct from research <laughs> to implementation, right? No. There's usually years and years of trials and experimentation and, you know, more research and more research and try to refine the process. But now, because it was a crisis, it's like, well, mm -hmm. we need to do it now. Um, so indeed it might, so it might be overblown how, you know, quickly things go from science to, to let's say the rest of the world um, in this case. But I agree with you that it's still very important to discuss you know, the uncertainty of your research or at least where you are not sure or where there might be factors that you're not considering, right? Or, or could possibly exist that you're not considering. Mm. It's difficult to, in some sense, It would be extremely difficult to know what you don't know, right? This is all this this you know unknown knowns or unknown unknown. What <laughs> well, is something like that? Known <laughs> unknowns, yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. It, it, in your opinion, do you think it's done enough, or or in a sufficient manner, this sort of communication of uncertainty of science? I don't know. It's not only the job of scientists as well. I mean, it, it, there's definitely these layers because mm -hmm. scientists, okay, our main form of communication is with papers, very technical. Not everybody's gonna be able to read that. And then there's the next layer of like, um, the popular science articles. So that layer is kind of translating from technical to more available generally. And that layer has to strike a very difficult balance. 
Yes. They have to be popular. They have to be understandable, but also convey this research probably isn't going to save the world. It's pretty cool, but this one idea is still in its infancy or whatever might limit you know, the conclusions that are being drawn. And I think there, a lot of times, I'll read popular science articles about fusion and think, that is something else. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what I think about that. <laughs> I, I've, I, to be fair, I share that sentiment completely. Because <laughs> sometimes I read, I read the articles and I'm like, well, then why are we all researching? We've got the answer, <laughs> it's out there. Like, just, just make it. <laughs> Right? What are so, they doing? Yeah, yeah. Even even as a scientist, like, who knows what happens? Let's say behind you know behind those those in the detailed world. Um, read this article and just like, oh man, someone someone out there figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we all doing magnetized target fusion? Come on, yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> so like, I think there is there is a sentiment there of like the not hyperbole, but um, sort of like, uh, what's, yeah, it's a, a clickbait. Sure, yeah, that's something, that's a, that's what people do as well in order to get people into to reading the article, but also the art, the text, like, you know, the inside, the actual context of the article um, is also a bit uh, promotionary, like, it, you know, it's or dramatized, it's dramatized, that's it, there was a word, and I, it's just like leaving my head completely, <laughs> like, there was a word that I like to use, and I don't know what it is anymore, um, but in a sense, dramatization, similar, similar, um, of that message makes it, you know, more appealing to people who are not on the scientific side, right, because it gives them it gives them an insight into what is happening and sort of like, you know, um, hope, I guess, that, that it's progressing. And it's hard to say that if you didn't do it that way, that it would be better, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. At least in my head, do, do you have, what's your opinion on it? That if they were to do a bit less dramatization? I mean, if we, if fusion was the only one not being dramatized, then yeah, maybe it would hurt us because we're still research focused. We're not delivering any products. It's just still science and figuring out how to do what we yeah. wanna do, how to put fusion energy on the grid. And yeah, I hope Hope we can find a way to convey the excitement and the challenge because I think that's what's kept fusion going is it has this huge potential and and that's pretty easy to get across is its potential but then the challenge is get pretty technical mm -hmm. but if yeah. people don't understand how challenging fusion is and they won't understand why it's taking so long mm. and why it probably will take many more years to put fusion energy on the grid i see okay so it's sort of like the the actual walls that we're hitting are it requires so much knowledge to even understand why that is a wall right that it becomes yeah. difficult it becomes difficult to to get that message across or i mean i think it's it's important to simplify it and explain the challenges mm -hmm. is what i'm saying like learn like learning the details of those challenges is our job like you and me yeah um and then filtering out just the essential information to tell people is very very important yeah i i would say it's not 
actually a skill that is taught um, in the scientific field, right? I mean, me personally, I've never had any training on how to reduce the information into something digestible, no. maybe for another scientist, but not for anyone, you know, no more than that. Other, other than that. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. So I think it is, it's, it's a difficult issue to how do we get people to understand that, how do we get scientists to understand that that is an issue, right? Mm -hmm. Because in the end, they have to, they're the ones who know, so they are the ones who are capable of doing the simplification. It's really hard to ask someone else to do it, right? Mm. Yeah, definitely in the masters at Eindhoven, we, you know, you focus on learning the technical things. Uh, it's a technical university, so we didn't have to take a communication course. And yeah, we took the philosophy, we took the philosophy of science one where we talked about, you know, how to convey the uncertainty in your work. But it was more philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> in what sense? I mean, finish your point, but in what I'm curious in what sense. <laughs> um but for the masters yeah we had a little we had an assignment on okay to write a little summary of your work for the audience level that you specify so that was practice in choosing an audience and writing for that audience but one little practice and not so much feedback yeah it wasn't it wasn't the focus it wasn't uh prioritized pretty clearly that's that's very clear i think as my experience with many students through this program it, this sort of gets kind of put at the very end of their mm -hmm. project that they just sort of produce something but it's not not the priority of the student and i'm wondering if it's in the grading scheme it's graded as a equal priority to the report i think but it is treated in practice of di different priority and i'm curious why that is how did it turn out that way right um but yeah. maybe this is not something <laughs> you, you can you can say but or maybe you have something to say on this I know that it's not, it's not actually graded as heavily as the report, mm -hmm. the scientific level report. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think it's a shame, but I was lucky because I came from a less technical background a more liberal arts background where I had to learn a lot, like a broad array of topics. And I was talking to people with all sorts of different backgrounds. And then I literally had to take a communications course where we learn how to give presentations and convince and, and that kind of thing. So I think I see it easier than maybe some other people who came from a technical background. Yeah, that's really cool. So I didn't know that about you at all. Do Liberal, you have... liberally educated? <laughs> well, that, that yeah, also, <laughs> also, and also that you did this sort of uh, education on communication um, previously. So, yeah. uh, do you have some advice on that? Like, how do you think the technical field can improve, um, other than just practice? Like, mm -hmm. are there certain pitfalls that people do that? are really counterproductive in terms of communication? Well, I think that it's, it's very cliche to say it as someone who's liberally educated to say, oh, I think a liberal arts education is so important. Right. I, I think it is though. <laughs> <laughs> fair me up. No, I, fair enough, fair enough. There's, 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 Technical education is very good, very useful. You see all of this, this 
high level stuff being done around technical universities like in Eindhoven. And there's this weird attitude at Eindhoven. Like when I touch, talk to the bachelor students, they have to take other classes like I think they have to take a philosophy class or something else and it's like a burden it's it's just a requirement that is not enjoyed mm -hmm. and I definitely saw all of the liberal arts requirements at times a burden but I really appreciate it now and most of them I appreciated at the time that I got you know philosophy, religious studies, gender studies, language, literature. I think in terms of life and being able to talk to different kinds of people, not just scientists, mm -hmm. it really, really helped. Mm -hmm. So and if for communication specifically, I wish that when we were being taught communication, it wasn't an afterthought. Hmm. Like you learn communication by giving presentations in the masters, but there's no real structured advice on how to give a presentation. It's kind of, oh, I throw together a maybe 10 minutes, uh, you know, lesson on how to give a presentation, but no real, we're gonna sit down, we're gonna learn best practices and we're gonna, pra we're gonna practice and give real feedback on how you're presenting. And I see it when I see people give all of these science lunches, there's a hu huge spread on how well people can summarize their information and then give it in a understandable way. There's a broad range and it, it's kind of luck of the draw, what you're capable of and what your background is that makes you better or worse at it. But yeah, you know. Absolutely. So I, I think you are hitting on some good points here that there is no structured lesson or course on how to present scientific communication. I know at the PhD level, they make you take this sort of two, two, three day course over many weeks. Um, and a lot of people found it very insightful. But at the PhD level is because you also are hitting the point where you need to do presentations. So there's the interest, right? The, the, the people at the PhD level kind of understand they have to do presentations and they should oh, do them good. well. But maybe in the, the bachelor or the, the master's level, it's sort of, as you said, like a burden. It's like an extra. It's like, I've got all this technical courses to do and they're pretty heavy, you know, a lot of details that I have to memorize or, mm. or learn. And then I have to do presentations on top. But it's like, okay, mm. that, that goes to the side which is a very unfortunate very very unfortunate so if you were to and maybe that's why there is also not such high demand for a communications course because it is seen as that do you have any advice on how to you know change the you know turn the tables a bit to promote communication as something that is not just nice to do but crucial right I mean, I think it's all down to, all down to the people, starting with the administration, you know, they have to recognize that it's important and find the right people to do the teaching. Cause if it's, if it's in their mind an afterthought, they won't prioritize finding a really good person to teach communications to the students. Mm -hmm. And if, if the professor's bad, there's no way that it's gonna leave a positive memory in the students' minds. Mm -hmm. of, oh yeah, communication, it's important, it's fun. Yeah. Like the, the, the knowledge, these best practices for, for scientific communication is out there. Like there are textbooks on it. 
And it's just finding the right people who are willing to disseminate that to students is, is crucial. So I think, yeah, it, it, it has to do with the people at the top level, the organization and their enthusiasm for it. And I hope this, I guess this is a trickle down theory. I hope <laughs> that it will permeate to the students that enthusiasm. Right. Okay. That's, that's actually, so that's a, that's a good strategy. Now, now, personally, I'm from the other camp, I guess, which is not the trickle down strategy. <laughs> I'm more of a, a grassroots type of person. <laughs> so I mean, neither here nor there. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. Um, it's just different ways of looking at it. Because fundamental in... economic differences, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know, I'm not farther than one percent, you know. <laughs> uh, but the thing is that from uh, my education and my batches, I found the most effective teachers, like the ones that were clearly into their work, knew how to say it in a way that would get your attention and hold it, were the people who were doing it, like who did it as their job, who, mm -hmm. you know, was not just that they were teaching you what they know because and that information they give you is basically from yesterday not from 10 <laughs> years ago right mm. and that those were the ones who were most inspiring to me let's put it that way uh, that put me on the path of you know higher education and learning and everything like that because they they really exemplified what it was to learn and keep up right with mm. with the uh, field but in that sense, right, if, if you just teach out of a textbook, you kind of get like, you know, calculus one, the most boring class of all time, right? <laughs> right? So it's, it's hard to, to say if the person, the, the teacher is not someone who does live and breathe communication and does a lot of effective presentations to a wide variety of audiences, if the information they would disseminate would be one relevant to the current day and age or two actually effective right mm. because uh, there are a lot of books out there that are just written to be written right not necessarily super um effective <laughs> right so in that sense do you do you is it too difficult to like if the first iteration of such a course has to be perfect it's basically not going to work because the chances that you get everything lining up that way is is really really hard so is there a method that do you foresee or can you see a method that is a bit more you know tolerant of you know minor failures or or mm. non non-optimal performances here and there, right? But still gets the job done in time. Yeah, I guess I see your point that if it's just a communications course, like out of a textbook, it might not be so inspiring that yeah, it'd be better to learn from people who are clearly good at scientific communication and practice. Mm -hmm. um, I disagree that good communication goes with enthusiasm for your job. I don't think that those two always go hand in hand. Someone can be very intelligent doing the work, telling you what they did yesterday, but in a very effective way. <laughs> But in a very ineffective way. Ineffective. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, fair, fair sometimes enough. it just doesn't come across. Fair enough. Yeah. It does not a. It's not a implies b. Therefore, yeah. b implies a. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. If they if they are simultaneous, fantastic. Mm -hmm. But not always. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean, right? The stars the, the stars already don't align, right? So mm. it's it's difficult to get someone in that position who is going to have everything. Right. Mm. So if we assume that they don't, is there a, a better way other than relying on inspiration per se? I mean, 
maybe if it was kind of a more flexible approach, like, okay, not, we're going to teach a course on it that's given in this one quartile or whatever, but coming up with best practices that I think the biggest thing was there are not this, this, this definition of what makes good communication that is universal, that's published, that's known. Like it kind of seems to be different for different people. I got lots of feedback about my communication and sometimes they conflicted. Mm. It's, it's a very personal thing, but I wish that there was a overarching best practices defined at some level maybe the mm. university level, maybe the department level. But then it could be more flexible with how you teach the students those practices. It could be applied, like we're going to give a presentation in two weeks. And then here are the lessons we want you to consider. I and think then give feedback on it. Yeah, that's fair. I think it's in that sense, more important to understand what are the most crucial components of a presentation and everything else is style, right? Or a personal, personal taste. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, difficult for me to say because also I have gotten a lot of conflicting feedback from various members of the scientific community on how to present information, what information is even important in the first place. Um, and it becomes, from my point of view, more confusing to take into account their feedback than it is to just do it my way, which is, you know, a terrible thing to say, but <laughs> right in this collaborative atmosphere. It makes total sense to me. I don't know. Yeah, but it is, it is there, right? It, it, some, some things are personal style, a personal touch. It's what makes it authentic, let's say. It's, it's what gives it life rather than, so there's the information you need to say, the information you have to have, like the, and the, the have to have correct also because it's like basics but then everything else on top of that is sort of you know the manner in which you do it and what's effective what gets across to the audience who's your audience mm -hmm. there right so i agree with you on that aspect it would be nice to have like a structured set of fundamentals and really to teach people what is the difference between those fundamentals and what is you know where you have some personal freedom to Mm. adjust it to your tastes right um yeah. but it's hard to it's hard to write it down that's all i'm gonna say not that i would be against mm -hmm. it but it would be very difficult <laughs> um yeah okay so i guess it also comes back down to to this whole feedback thing so just a corollary question you said how is it to get in your opinion conflicting feedback Right, like it, you said, you were talking about consistent feedback before, but what if you get conflicting feedback? How how do you handle that? Mm. It hasn't happened to me too much. I know that it would definitely be stressful if it happened, especially if it came from people who I really like trusted and and wanted them to to think I was doing well it would be difficult to balance uh, both opinions do you would you have to in your opinion yeah that's the thing <laughs> is is whether you have to take people's feedback into account mm -hmm. which I think a lot of successful people would say no, like don't listen to the haters. <laughs> haters gonna hate. <laughs> gonna hate. <laughs> I love that phrase, by the way. It's the best. <laughs> haters gonna hate. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, at the, the most funny time I heard that phrase, actually, this is not relevant. You can cut this if you want. But no, no. <laughs> so I was in I was in a 50s musical. And for this, obviously, I had to have the very tight curled hair. I didn't know how to do my hair. Also, okay. my hair is very straight. So when I tried to curl it, it would come uncurled in the time it took me to get from home to the theater. They were oh. like, I told you to curl your hair. I said, I did. It's come out right. So long story short, everybody, all the other girls were curling their hair themselves. I was getting it professionally done before every show by one of the hairdressers. Oh. And she, one time she was curling me, she was chatting. She was very friendly. And she said, oh, I heard some of the girls saying, why does Marion get to have her hair done professionally when we had to do it? And she's this, you know, a little bit, the chubby, very white, uh, a little bit Southern lady. And she said, okay. you, know what? you know what, hon? Haters gonna hate. I'm gonna say it every day. Haters gonna hate. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Getting my hair curled, 50s style, having the lady say, haters gonna hate. Hate is gonna hate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like sometimes it's just that's that's the way it is. This is the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> Let it roll off your back. Yeah. And get your hair done. Yeah. And, and there's something there's side. something about that Southern American attitude. It's just, you know, like <laughs> they they some they have a they have some things right. Let's put it that way. <laughs> they have some things very right. <laughs> um, but that's true. So like getting getting back to this feedback point of view is that I think there is a lot of pressure um, in the scientific community to take all the feedback on board, mm -hmm. right? Especially maybe in the fusion community because we're a bit more collaborative in general than, than many other scientific fields. So there is this sort of, you know, how you have to, please all play different nice. parties yeah play, play nice, nice everybody. yeah and it's not not necessarily a bad thing because you know we are all working towards a final goal it's better to be collaborative than competitive but at some point yes it is also take your take everything with a grain of salt right mm -hmm. it's sort of like if it doesn't make sense it just doesn't make sense <laughs> right yeah it's it's having that growth mindset of like if somebody gives you feedback that you don't agree with or that like is really throwing you for a loop just let it roll off you i mm. guess it's interesting though talking about fusion and collaboration i didn't know this in russia mm -hmm. they have completely russian language journals mm -hmm. and yeah they they and, and I, you know, I went to Plasma Surf the past two weeks as a summer program, and people from all over were there. There were a few Russians there. I was talking to them, and they thought it was totally normal. Like, does not every country have their native language journal about science? And I was like, no, totally <laughs> not. That's not a normal thing. Oh, only the countries that have, you know, the English as their native language. <laughs> <laughs> I think China as well, though. I've seen papers in Chinese as well. Yeah, that's true. There are. I think it's funny because I think um, some of the very, like, I mean, the tokamak is a Russian concept and a lot of- They have a lot going the on. The original work was Russian, published in Russian. And I, I still remember in Differ, we were running around because someone had a paper in Russian. Who knows how to read Russian? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and it came out of like the most random place. Um, it was some guy in the other, in the uh, actually in the computational field who just happened to have worked in Russia and taught English in Russia. So he knew Russian. Mm -hmm. And so he read it for, or <laughs> translated it for us as best he could because there were some technical terms, but it was just like super random. Like these are things you wouldn't have guessed would be, you know, in the modern science. Yeah. world something that people would have to uh, contend yeah. with yeah it was very strange to me but like talking to this russian guy and and yeah realizing that the fusion community itself is still not 
you know, fully collaborative. I kind of thought, okay, people are going to all these different places, the US, Japan, and all over Europe, uh, collaborating constantly, but there's still kind of sects that are working with themselves and, and I don't know, I can't immediately judge whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or just a neutral thing, I don't know. It was surprising to me though, to learn that, that, that it's not kind of accepted that we should be a universal front of fusion. Yeah, it's just weird to me, I don't know. Do you think that, you, do you think that there should be, was it surprising because you thought there would be more? And do you think there should be more now that you've seen what happens? Or like, is it just sort of like a generic, this is not what I expected kind of thing? I mean, in my idealistic mind, I think we would all be sharing our ideas and, and be able to take advantage of everybody's uh, breakthroughs mm -hmm. which to me says let's work in a in a common language but i mean competition definitely helps push things forward faster as well um though the is it really competition if you don't know what the other people are doing because you can't understand the papers that they're writing? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think that's sort of like the extreme competition, right? Where it's, <laughs> you have a goal and then everything is separated. So there's no information mm -hmm. sharing between mm -hmm. the two camps, which is probably not the way we want it to be, but you know, there is still a fair amount of collaboration uh, in that in that sense of the Russian universities to you know attend the European things and you know invite us to their to their institutes to learn, but they just continue publishing in Russian. I guess I, I I don't know if it's a continuing practice to be honest, but I know it has been that way in the past. Mm. But I, I think that the, I think a little bit of both, as you mentioned, is is actually the right way to do it, right? Because you need the the urgency and the motive and the you know, it's sort of like a friendly competition is what we're aiming for. But you know, <laughs> that doesn't always work out that way. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, actually though but i think we're running close to the end of our time at the hour already there's all there's another full topic i want to discuss with you <laughs> which we didn't even touch right so i, I hope there is room to put you in bring you back for the bring you back yeah lesson. i was gonna say because <laughs> i did i did really want to discuss and i will mention it now just to sort of you know sneak peek the viewers into it <laughs> Um, put yourself on record yeah put myself on record hold myself accountable right <laughs> um is what it's like to be a woman in the scientific field especially this one um mm -hmm. I, I know that you've had a varying amount of experience all of it relevant to this topic so it would be nice to have your point of view on that yeah. now Sadly, we don't have time. Yeah, but I don't is... think there's time to do it justice. No, exactly. So I would love <laughs> to bring you back to to discuss that in full because that that is really a topic that I I personally have a bit of of interest in figuring out what's what's happening. Um, but um, since we're coming, I to have the a end... funny story actually. Oh, sure, I have sure. A story. Just like I was talking to a friend the other day, and he said he mentioned me to someone else who goes to to Eindhoven. And he, she said, oh, wait, I, I think I actually know her. Was she the girl in the plasma physics class with the short hair? And I was like, wow, OK, I guess I can just be described with those two things. And then I thought, well, actually, in Eindhoven, in a plasma physics class, girl is probably enough. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. Short hair <laughs> makes it 
<laughs> undeniably you. A unique specifier. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> undeniably you, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it is strange how few, how few you know qualifiers you need to to uniquely identify you, yeah. right? As far as if they had to identify you know one of your classmates would mm. be a little harder if they didn't know the name, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the tall white dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's. Strange, but we can go into this in much greater detail in another yeah. podcast. I would love to, actually. Um, but in this last 10 minutes, I do want to give you the opportunity to promote something in in your life, be it science-related or, or not, if you have something you would like to put out there for the viewers to know. Yeah, sure. Well, I know this is supposed to be for, like, not necessarily fusion students, but if you're a fusion student, <laughs> fair enough. Um, then, like I mentioned, I just came back from this summer program called Plasma Surf at um, the Institute for Plasmas and Nuclear Fusion in Lisbon, Portugal, which was a whole lot of fun. It's hosted hopefully every summer. It was very, very surprising that it was in person this summer, but they made it work. Against all odds, it happened. Um, and it's, yeah, a lot of fun. If you are interested in learning about fusion or plasmas, or you just want to go to Portugal and surf for the summer, it's only two weeks, but surf for two weeks, then I highly recommend going to it. And I will, there will be, I hope an article that I write about Plasma Surf on the FuseNet website coming out in some time. Some time. Actually, yeah. that's a good that's a good point. I should put a link to the FuseNet website or the newsletter somewhere in this. I will do it. Let's hope it shows up. <laughs> um, but that's very good. And I have had other colleagues also attend this Plasma Surf school in the past, and they have all had, you know, absolutely stellar reviews for it so yeah i i think that that is a a solid promotion that you gave there <laughs> thanks Aaron. <laughs> all right then so in that essence then uh, we'll close it here thank you mariam for coming on and being a guest in this podcast and uh yeah we'll everybody keep in touch for the next episode of coffee breakdown see you